Split was one of the coolest movie going experiences I've ever had. When that ending hit, I just had chills. The energy in the theater was amazing during that final scene, but it wasn't until I went back and rewatched it later that I truly realized how brilliant it was. There were hints about the ending all throughout the movie. If you want to hear about all of them, then stick around to the end of this video. I'd recommend watching my things you missed in Unbreakable first since I will be referencing it. Both Split and Unbreakable open with a birthday scene. In Unbreakable, it was the birth of Elijah Price, and in Split, Claire Benoit celebrates her birthday. At the end of the party, her dad offers a ride to her classmate, Casey Cook, but he never quite makes it into the car. Last week, I described how David Dunn and Elijah Price are color-coded, with David being associated with green and Elijah being purple. The Horde has their own color too, yellow. It can be seen in Dennis's handkerchief, Hedwig's jacket, the flowers placed around the holding room and at the train station, the lighting and wall colors throughout the area below maintenance, as well as the tiles above ground at the zoo. In the poster for Glass, the colors for each character are made clear. There are 24 sets of titles in the opening and closing credits of Split, one for each of the 24 identities of the Horde. The opening credits also have letters connected by a vertical line in a way that makes it look like two entries on a timeline, just as this is the second entry in the series. The accompanying music by West Dylan Thordson sounds like distorted animal cries. Take a listen. So the girls are kidnapped and put in this holding room. Claire and Marcia have different ideas about how to get out than Casey, and the room is vertically split, just like the title of the movie, by this power line to show the divide. Vertical divisions of the frame are also a technique used a lot in Alfred Hitchcock's horror classic, Psycho. M. Night Shyamalan, the director of Split, lists Hitchcock as a huge influence. He even released a 10-minute video on his appreciation of Hitchcock's Strangers on a Train. There are other Psycho references in Split, but we'll get to them when we get to them. Casey tells Marcia to pee herself when Dennis takes her out of the room, hoping to prevent Dennis from forcing her to do something that she doesn't want to do. The fact that Dennis is a germaphobe works in her favor, but really, that was just luck. Around this time, one of the other identities, Barry, reaches out to their psychologist, Dr. Fletcher. She's got several other emails on the screen. Just as the art department of Unbreakable had cameos in the newspaper, the crew of Split makes cameos in Dr. Fletcher's email. Charles S. Rowe is credited as a miscellaneous crew member, John B. West, Dominic Catanza Wright, and John Rusk were part of the production department, Mitch Campbell, Lucas Andre, Jennifer Wessner, Ed Mendez, and Bob Lowery all worked visual effects. Skip Leavesay, Brian Baker, Adam Leach, and Matthew Shapiro were part of the post-production team, and Lisa Liberati is James McAvoy's girlfriend. One of the emails mentions Cezanne, the French painter, and we'll come back to that later. I love all these movies with just disturbing pictures in the background. Anyway, Barry comes to see Dr. Fletcher, but it's not really Barry. Dr. Fletcher asks if he's looking for something, but he's actually putting the room back in order because it's really Dennis, the guy with OCD. Imagine having a disorder within your disorder. Maybe Mr. Glass can relate. I have something called osteogenesis imperfecta. It's a genetic disorder. My name is Dr. Ellie Staple, and I'm a psychiatrist. I specialize in those individuals who believe they are superheroes. Anyway, the supposed Barry talks about making a jacket with hand-printed newspaper headlines. It's supposed to be like a, like a tailored jacket, but I'm gonna hand-print it with newspaper headlines. I know someone who happens to have a collection of newspaper headlines. Also, in Dr. Fletcher's office, there's a picture on the wall of what appears to be a woman looking behind a shower curtain. This is one of those psycho references I was talking about. After Dennis leaves, Dr. Fletcher goes through her patient files. The only one that's legible is this one, on a Mr. Douglas Luttrell, and as far as I can tell, the name is not relevant, but the dates on the file range from July 2000 to November 2000. November 2000 is when Unbreakable was released, and most of the movie is set within these dates. For example, the encounter with the Orange Man in Unbreakable takes place just before October 23rd, 2000. She also has a bin labeled Universal Offices. You can probably guess who produced this movie. Dead, dead. Dr. Fletcher visits an art gallery to view this Cezanne painting, probably the one she received the email about earlier. This piece is called The Bathers. Would it be too much of a stretch to relate this to David Dunn's swimming pool accident or fear of water? If your answer is yes, that is too much of a stretch, then fine. But there's no denying this line from Dr. Fletcher's associate, Joe, was an intentional clue. You treat of them like they're supernaturally gifted, like, like they have powers or something. Karen, these are patients. They have been through trauma. Whoa, that's a good one. 
I'm curious if any of you picked up on that the first time through, and at what point did you actually realize this was a sequel? I tried to look for some more clues in Dr. Fletcher's notes on the various identities, but I couldn't really make out anything. I don't know if this was supposed to be a joke on that whole trope about doctors having bad handwriting, but I can't read any of it. So let's go back to Casey and the girls. Casey awakes from a flashback, and we see her point of view, which is sideways. When I talked about Unbreakable, I examined the right side up versus upside down shots in that movie, so maybe these sideways shots in Split are a little bit of an in-between. This is also one of the first times we get a good peek out of the holding room, and there's a container of Barnum Animal Crackers, one of the earliest clues towards their location being the Philadelphia Zoo. It took forever to get this place safe without the nosy bodies that work here finding out you can't get out of here! Back at Dr. Fletcher's office, we've got our M. Night Camp in the form of this guy, who helps Dr. Fletcher review security footage of Dennis deliberately trying to prove that he's Barry by walking through the trash. When Patricia brings Casey and Marcia into the kitchen, you can briefly see that they all have different cereal preferences, which I found to be an interesting detail. One of the things I talked about in Unbreakable is how we always see Elijah through a glass reflection to represent the fragile nature of his disorder. We see Elijah through the reflection each time he's introduced at a new age. In Split, we see Dennis in the reflection of this certificate just before he first introduces himself to Dr. Fletcher. There's another reflection scene later on, which I'll come back to. But in this conversation, we find out that the 24th identity, the Beast, resides away from the other 23 identities in a train yard. Because Kevin's dad left on a train when he was young, presumably that was East Rail 177. Casey convinces Hedwig to show her his room, which, in another clue about them being under the zoo, is filled with animal posters and toys. Additionally, the song that he famously dances to in his room is called Frog Bass, by the artist currently known as Snails. And this is actually a pretty good drawing of Reshiram, if that's what that's supposed to be. Hedwig shows Casey the walkie-talkie that he stole from Dennis, and Casey uses it to try to call for help. But the man on the other end just thinks that it's his friend pulling his leg, and assures him that he still has the orange headphones. When Casey eventually does get out at the end of the movie, we do see him listening to those orange headphones before he calls the police. But before any of that, there's a very important flashback to where a young Casey holds her abusive uncle at gunpoint, in a scene that's very, very reminiscent of Joseph holding David at gunpoint in Unbreakable. Roll it. Sin, do what your mother. This isn't funny. Joseph, what the hell are you doing? Is it loaded? Joseph, did you load that gun? Casey? Joseph. I'm your uncle. No, I am your father. Stop it, Casey. Joseph! Put that gun down. Sir, and I am telling you to put that man that gun down right now! I'm getting upset. I'm about to get very angry. You are about to be in big trouble! Get it. No! Could have killed me. These scenes take place at almost the exact same point in both movies. Maybe one day I'll do a side-by-side -side comparison, but that sounds like another video. Dr. Fletcher's concern leads her to try to talk to the Horde at his home, so she pulls up in a taxi. Remember how the Channel 4 News logo in Unbreakable was very reminiscent of the Fantastic Four logo? Well, the letter T in this taxi cab service is also a reference to the Teen Titans logo. The pieces are all coming together, as Dennis visits the train station to transform into the Beast, and it's an Amtrak train, just like East Rail 177. Casey explores the Horde's computer, and this is where we see the video diaries of each member. One of them is named Norma, which completes the trifecta of Psycho references, this one referencing Norma Bates. At some point, Dr. Fletcher realizes she probably won't make it out alive, but she leaves a note for the captive girls to find. The note is written on a receipt from Hagenbaugh Laboratories, which is not a thing. But, Emily Hagenbaugh is the author of this superhero book. So you know how the rest goes. Casey has her confrontation with the Beast, the Beast sees that she too has gone through some abuse, and lets her live. Someone finds her and escorts her from below the maintenance area, and the orange headphones guy calls the police. One of the most disturbing things to me is that even after all that Casey has been through, she still doesn't want to go back with her uncle at the end. That's how bad he is. But there's one more loose end that still hasn't been tied up, 
on my end. I mentioned the Unbreakable reference where we see the horde in the reflection of Dr. Fletcher's office, just like those Elijah Price scenes in the first movie. The final scene with the horde goes all in on this, and includes the panning back and forth camera movement as seen in many of the scenes in Unbreakable. All the while, James Newton Howard's Unbreakable soundtrack slowly transitions in as we cut to the credits and the iconic in-credit scene and the reveal of David Dunn. I've got goosebumps just thinking about it. Now the stage is set for glass, and I could not be more excited. So, join me next week as I break down everything you might have missed in the conclusion to the East Rail 177 trilogy. Remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we both survive. <laughs>